So hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Jason Daniels. I'm the CTO for Hybrid IT in EMEA, and if you haven't noticed, I work for Fujitsu. Um, before I begin, um, I, ran this, I said this yesterday in the marketplace session and it didn't go particularly well, so we'll try again. Can anybody here tell me the current temperature in their house from their phone? Okay, Hive and Nest obviously haven't come this far yet. Um, can anybody turn on the kettle from their phone? No lazy people, good, good, good. And the last geek test of them all, can anybody tell me the current status of their Tesla car? <clears throat> no, no Teslas? No, not yet? Okay, cool. So the, the point I'm trying to make is we're living in a hyper-connected world where every device and every person are interconnected, okay? Which is pretty cool for everyone as a consumer. Um, but that actually poses a massive challenge in the enterprise space for companies that need to compete in the digital era. So a big enterprise, a monolithic block, slow to respond. <clears throat> How does a company like that actually compete uh, for the digital age and um, innovate for the future? And that's quite a tough thing to do. Uh, at Fujitsu, we recognized this a few years ago, and we created something that we call MetaArch. Um, MetaArch is our digital business platform. So you can't buy MetaArch. It's a platform, an ecosystem of tooling and methodologies, okay? And when bought together, help uh, deliver digital transformation for a company. Some of the technology within MetaArch consists of uh, IoT, uh, big data, analytics, security, uh, and something called artificial intelligence. Why, why is that cool? Well, in, in this respect, and, and with uh, OpenStack, uh, it's really cool because everything I've just spoken about is powered by something we call K5. And K5 is Fujitsu's next generation clay platform, which is powered by OpenStack. It's a global OpenStack deployment, okay? So uh, it's currently live in Japan at the moment, live in three regions in, in, Japan, in Japan, went live in the UK earlier on in the year. Um, so that's four regions, all with multiple availability zones, into another three more countries by the end of this year, and around another eight next year. <clears throat> So it's on track to actually be one of the largest global deployments of OpenStack uh, globally in the world, uh, which is pretty cool and pretty impressive. Um, we're here today to talk, and if you were in a marketplace session yesterday, you would have seen some of this, but we're going to go into a bit more detail. We're here today to talk about artificial intelligence and, and how OpenStack as a base platform delivers the agility that's needed by a next generation service like artificial intelligence. Okay, so we're really lucky that we have uh, some, uh, a member of Fujitsu from our, our labs in the United Kingdom who actually focuses on artificial intelligence technology. Um, and, and lately, uh, Roger and his team have been focusing on OpenStack to see how OpenStack, a company with next generation technology such as Clade Foundry, Apogee, and the other usual suspects that you would see, when brought together, can really deliver the agile and globally distributed platform to deliver next generation artificial intelligence. And that's quite a big thing for us. What's even more important for us is that K5, uh, MetaArch, powers the transformation of the enterprise, but more importantly, powers our future. Powers people, it powers how we work today and how we will work for the future, putting people first, okay? Uh, and that's really human-centric innovation. Um, so, I'd like to hand over to Roger. Roger's going to talk to you around some really clever artificial intelligence stuff. Um, the, the, the point here is that that's powered by OpenStack. Okay, so some of the really clever processing from, a, from an AI perspective that you're going to see is delivered via an ice house, uh, sorry, an ice house distribution at the moment, okay, of OpenStack. Um, soon we're upgrading to Kilo, and then from Kilo we will upgrade further. But uh, like big service providers, we need to stabilize on a certain version first. Um, so uh, at that point, I'll hand, hand over to Roger. Thanks. Hi there. <coughs> Thanks, Jason. So yeah, my name is uh, Roger Mende. I am uh, working in Fujitsu Laboratories. And um, yeah, so Fujitsu Laboratories is a bit like K5, is a, a globally dispersed uh, set of uh, activity. So we have activity in Japan, uh, activity in China, in America and uh, in Europe. I'm working out of the office in London and uh, we also have an office in Madrid, so a couple of uh, sites in Europe. And yeah, today um, 
Uh, yeah, so we have some AI research, some machine learning research, and uh, this is running uh, on K5, which of course running on top of uh, OpenStack. And I'm going to describe uh, uh, what our AI does. In rough terms, it takes some data uh, coming in, uh, and it produces insight on the other side. So the data could be uh, timestamp data or non-timestamp data. Could involve uh, um, data from sensors, data from social uh, uh, sources, or anything else. Uh, and we have a, well, we'd like to think it's a special approach uh, with regards what happens inside the box, marked ML. And so I'm going to bring that to life with three scenarios today. One is going to be uh, with, to do with signature analysis. The second one will be um, uh, related to driving. And the third one will be 3D shapes, uh, recognizing 3D shapes. And uh, this is all a combination of work from the labs in London and various people working in, on these topics and working with the business in terms of uh, cloud enabling it. And uh, yeah, at the end, I'll finish up with some summary thoughts about how we are, how K5 is helping us achieve uh, this whole thing. So the first thing is uh, signature analysis. So, uh, you know, it's 2016, but even in 2016, we're still signing signatures and uh, we're still using signatures in a workflow for people to assert and prove their identity. And, uh, okay, machine learning has come on in the last five years and it's made this an, uh, a, a problem which is easier to solve, but it's quite a challenge. Here's uh, one of the... Uh, one way of expressing the challenge. If you have these three signatures, which you can see there, is that fourth signature considered to be a good likeness? I.e., is it an inlier or an outlier? Does it lie inside kind of what would be acceptable? Does it lie outside? Um, so, you know, the service we produce, you know, it keeps uh, lots of different signatures for various people. And, uh, you know, you would like to provide a signature into the system and uh, so here you can see someone inserting a, a signature there and asking the system to see if it looks the same. In this case it says it's an outlier, probably because there was a little bit of a bump in the line in the middle of the signature there so it works out and you know gives you some suggestion whether it's an inlier or an outlier. Another way of using this system might be uh, in a, a scenario where you don't actually know the identity of someone uh, but you have lots of signatures and you have a new signature, can you say to which person does this signature belong? Or can you make some suggestions to which person does this signature belong? Uh, in this case here, um, again, I go for someone's going to put in some... Uh, whoops. Sorry. There you go and run this video again. Oh. The normal key I use to press the video doesn't work there, I'll go to the, go to the next one. Um, can I have some assistance from the, uh, uh, the back because I want to play that video and normally I would click on it and it would work so uh, maybe you know the answer, Jason. You click there. Okay, it's because you're in um, presentation mode, press that. Is that right? Yeah, you're dual. Uh, yeah, okay. Will that run there? Yeah. Is that okay holding that there? Yeah, yeah, that was all right there. But I think I'm going to hit the next problem again. Maybe we just take it out. All right. What happens there in that video is that you put your signature in and uh, it says again it's an outlier. So it's, it's a, there's a subtle difference in the signature you, you um, uh, insert and uh, it says it's an it's a outlier, inlier in that case. The next one here, it's, uh, it says it's an inlier. So the signature which you send. Uh, definitely not right. Sorry. All right. 
I'll move on. Okay, so anyway, what you saw there is, um, and this is a system in, image of what you saw there, uh, is essentially it's uh, hosted on K5, it's wrapped up as, uh, as a service, so it's driven by an API. Uh, the API is not very nice because it services uh, a client easily, so you can um, build clients very easy from an API. And uh, of course, once you collect various parts of uh, an overall ecosystem together, an API is really the fundamental thing which drives an ecosystem. So, you know, we're looking to have everything managed through an API. And of course, we like OpenStack in a similar way. So OpenStack, use, uh, we use OpenStack APIs to, for example, uh, manage our uh, inventory and repository of signatures or images, and we use those APIs as well. So APIs are very good. And, uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we outsource to Swift for the... Uh, um, storage of images, and we de decompose this into uh, uh, smaller steps inside. You know, as you can see, three boxes there. One is called imageification, one is the convolution of neural network, and the other one is a classification post-processing step. And so, you know, this is a good time to go into why our particular approach of to AI is uh, interesting and uh, original and quirky and unique and useful. So, I'm going to go into that next. So uh, we have this thing called imageification, and the definition of that, or our interpretation of what that means, is we turn any data problem into an image problem. And uh, so we've done this for many applications, and we have it for useful uh, real-world applications, which we'll see. So the, the, real, the regular approach, or the common approach, uh, you see, is that um, you create a neural network for every application domain, and uh, you configure and train it with uh, data uh, for every single time, every single application scenario you, you're looking at. Okay. And what we do is we use a single purpose general uh, neural network which is trained with image data, many different types of images, um, including you know, cats and dogs and that kind of thing. And so once you've trained that, and it's an intensive process, but it's a one-off process, once you've trained the neural network, it's it's got an ability to see features and patterns in images. So then once we, we can transform our input data onto an image, we can put those two things together. We can say, for whatever problem we have, we have that represented as an image. And we uh, compare that, or we use the general purpose neural network to um, look at the features and patterns in that image. Uh, so, you know, a, a word for this that people are using is called transfer learning, which means that you can, you know, you might be, you might learn how to see cats and dogs and see features in pictures of cats and dogs, but later on you can use that to see features in signatures or any type of uh, thing you might express as a picture. Uh, so, yeah, this essentially is what imageification does. It makes an image. Uh, so I'm going to give you another scenario, the second scenario, which is to do with driving. So, you know, suppose we want to promote safer driving, which means we want to monitor the driving uh, uh, activities of someone, and uh, maybe we'll use that in an insurance scenario where we can offer people an, uh, an improved insurance uh, um, offer based on the fact that they are not doing uh, disruptive things or uh, while they are driving, for example, eating or using their phone. So we can reward people who you know, show less of these bad habits. So I really hope this next video works. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so here, here we have a driving simulation. And, um, uh, and so I'll talk you through uh, this picture here and then we'll play the video. So uh, essentially, you know, it's, uh, um, um, uh, it's an experiment to show, this, uh, to show this system running. So the screen on the right-hand side basically shows the, um, my colleague Joe, who's driving, uh, uh, who coded this up and, and was one of the key inventors of this technique. So uh, he's driving the car, and uh, while he's driving, um, he is, you know, doing these things he shouldn't be doing, such as using his phone and eating. And in the left-hand screen, you can see the image which is generated based on that activity, which is measured. In this case, it's a physical device which measures his 
um, activity, but it could be uh, a non-physical device. Um, and so you can see in the picture here, uh, there is some uh, uh, picture which is produced. I'm just going to wait for that to do something. It's spinning, but maybe it will go. Ah, oh, there you go. Okay. That's it. So he's driving there, and uh, so and the, and as activity takes place, um, the 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 picture of the time series, because essentially it is a time series, is being uh, generated there. And at some point, uh, that that changes. So sometimes it's more uh, curvaceous, and sometimes it has more colour in it. Um, but the system knows what to look for, and just because it looks appealing to us and lots of colour doesn't necessarily mean. Um, uh, that it's interesting to the, um, uh, to the artificial intelligence looking at it. But at some point, it recognizes that it's here, yeah, driving here. And I think at 25 seconds, yes, it picks up the fact that the person is using a phone. And later on in the video, you can see oh, it's on a phone call now. So, you know, the, the image is changing. Uh, the, the visual recognition of the particular patterns are being picked up. Uh, so this person, yeah, driving whilst using the phone. I'm not sure, I think maybe he does some eating later on. So yeah, that's really what's uh, uh, a nice example of showing imagification in action, showing how um, it generates the, the images and uses that through this general purpose uh, uh, neural network and works out the activity, what's going on. The uh, the system image looks similar to the, uh, very similar, and that's actually the point, uh, to, the, uh, to the last, the one for the signatures. So there's, you know, there's a box. We're running it on K5. Uh, we're using the OpenStack APIs. Uh, we have a number of questions we'd want to ask of the, based on the incoming data. What are the current activities of the driver, for example, and uh, is it safe? Um, we can answer those questions as well. Uh, and yeah, so it, the convolutional neural network part is actually fairly fixed. We can do some uh, tweaking of, of that neural network to optimize it, but it's not, the, it's not a complete retrain. It's just um, some of the, some of the um, final layers can be tuned. Uh, and then the imageification and classification boxes, these are functions and feature, functions which you would customize for your application. So, and they lend themselves to you know, very nice stateless cloud functions as well. So you, you plug those in to support your different applications. Uh, and you know, on that uh, point of different applications, I've got uh, another uh, scenario here, which is um, 3D shape analysis. Uh, so suppose you dismantled um, uh, uh, a laptop or some form of machinery, and you was presented with a you were presented with a, a series of um, components from that machine. Could you uh, uh, take another shape and say, which shape is this? Can you see show other shapes which are a bit similar to this? Maybe another question you might ask is, what is the appropriate manufacturing cost? Uh, I have a little video here to show. I hope it works. So. In this video, I'll just describe it quickly. There is a, uh, this is a video of the demo. So there is a camera here um, recording um, um, an image of some object you place in front of the camera. And then the system basically tries to recognize what it is or tries to pull out what it might be. And uh, right. So in this case, the first shape that Serb and my colleague puts down is uh, some sort of heat diffuser, and it recognizes that fairly quickly there. So you can see there on the left-hand side, it's recognized the heat diffuser. The second thing is a, kind of like a monitor dongle, uh, and places that down, and uh, picks up, and has recognized it. Again, uh, there is some sort of intermediate. Well, this is an image by itself, but there is some manipulation of the image into a a more into a richer image, which is the imagification step. And yeah, places that into the system and, and recognizes the shapes. 
I can give a little bit more demo here. So these are all the different types of... Oh, it looks different on my screen to there. Okay, I won't go into that part. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so there is a, there is a, there is a kind of a, a visualizer here, which uh, uh, you, for any of these shapes here, it can show uh, uh, the shapes it's comparable to on the right-hand side. And uh, if the shapes are tagged as well, which would be additional metadata, it can say, you know, it's a, a, a pin or some sort of connector. And so you can figure out uh, uh, what it might be. Uh, right. Sorry, and you've got that turtle there on there, so it is. Right. Here we go. I'll go back again. What is this? I've got it, Jason, I think. That's my one. It must be. No, it's not. That's my one. No, it's not. Um, get it so it looks right on your screen. And then, oh, okay, it's because you're in a different mode. Can you drag it? It's class nice next to it on monitor. So you might be able to drag it up to it. All right. Maybe I can just uh, turn that off. No. If you get your window. Uh, get the shape window. If you want to pull up your web page with the shape on, is it? No, I'm not going to do the shape okay. one now. I think it's too complex. So yeah, if you get the presentation again and I play it, probably hit hit that there, and it'll put it up behind you. <coughs> Sorry, everyone, about that. I'm back again. You back? I'm back in the room. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there you go. I showed three examples there of the scenarios we've been looking at, signatures, shapes, and uh, driving. And uh, yeah, we have this running, or we're working um, on running this all on K5, and I've got some bullet points really about uh, some experience points of uh, how we've been uh, looking at that, the things we like, uh, and you know, things we look forward to doing in the future. So first of all, uh, what OpenStack gives us is this API-first approach. So, for um, you know, to program programmatically interact with the underlying OpenStack environment, this is very powerful because you know, for example, for in the simple case of object storage, we can do this from uh, our applications. Uh, in terms of pulling up and building a, 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 a machine learning deployment, we use Heat, which is great. So it's just one click, and you've got the whole infrastructure there and ready to go. Um, yeah, you know, based on the API, as uh, the APIs we use, this decomposition of the application into functions, and uh, and how it encourages the developer to. Um, to ensure that their application is cloud native and scales nicely, so we exploit the you know the linear scaling of uh, which OpenStack enables, and we get that benefit as well. So we've kind of at the moment we've decomposed the two parts, like the front part, which is the web web part, I guess the API side is is, is run through Cloud Foundry, and uh, which is very nice and we like very much. Um, it's quick and easy, and you know, it gives you uh, very nice, rapid deployment cycles. Uh, on the other hand, um, we did find with Cloud Foundry that some aspect that we like from Docker in terms of managing the underlying machine learning environment, we found wasn't quite so uh, mature or in, in Cloud Foundry. So what we did is we have a Cloud Foundry aspect of our application running, and then we have um, 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 an IaaS part, which is run using Docker to prepare the machine learning environment. And one of the benefits of our uh, imagification approach is that, um, yeah, it's this transfer learning, it's a one-off learning which, you can, which can take place offline or one time, yeah. and the actual execution of the model, which is pre-trained, 
isn't that intensive. So, um, so it gives us some flexibility in terms of deployment options. And so we kind of, in terms of deployment on K5, we split it into two parts, IaaS and PaaS, which is, well, nice in terms of uh, um, the, the possibilities we have. Uh, yeah, so the final summary from my side before I hand back to Jason. Um, so, we, yeah, this is a lab's activity in London, and uh, we have what we think is a very human-centric approach to doing uh, engineering AI on K5. It's human-centric because you don't get into uh, the um, hairiness of training uh, uh, a neural network and all the you know configuration and weighting which it takes in, a, in the in the general in the case when you have to create it for every scenario so you do it once and so from a human perspective you just have to draw a picture essentially take your data and draw a picture from it so it's a very human centric approach to AI and it, we've proven it in three cases in signature analysis, in driving 3D shapes, and there is more application areas to come. And we're at booth uh, A20 downstairs. Uh, should you like more information, please come and uh, talk to us. Thank you, Roger. Um, so I think what's really impressive with that is everything Roger just spoke about is powered by OpenStack. OK, so OpenStack gives Roger the agility he needs, the API ecosystem that he needs for his a application to be tr truly uh, agile and respond to the demand uh, that these very complex algorithms need. OK, uh, and that's pretty cool, right, from an OpenStack perspective. Does anyone here use artificial intelligence or machine learning on OpenStack <clears throat> at all? Nobody? OK, do, do we think that we may see an artificial intelligence or machine learning project from OpenStack? At some point, of course, we've got a Fujitsu guy there going, yes, we will. <laughs> um, you know, I truly believe that, that we will. Uh, hopefully, Fujitsu will contribute to that. So Fujitsu contributes with the sixth largest contributor to Mataka, or the fifth largest contributor to the Newton release. Um, so, we're, you know, <clears throat> we're really dedicated to OpenStack. We're dedicated to the evolution of the platform. Uh, more importantly, we hope we can provide some innovation as well along the way. Now, because the videos didn't play properly, we're ahead of time slightly. Um, so we'd like to open up now for some questions, which I'm sure everybody will have, right? Yes, Mr. Fujitsu, you can stand at the mic, please, I'm told. You need to... Nothing hard, please, draw. <laughs> Now, I just wanted to ask about... Uh, Joel, can you just let everyone know who you are, where you're from, and why you're here tonight? Joel okay. Gensler. Um, I work for G2 hybrid IT team, um, mainly focusing on the platform as a service side, but I have a question uh, regarding the artificial intelligence side, which is a hobby of mine. Um, regarding the training of the final layers of the network, rather than a full retraining of the entire model, is that a feature of CAFE or is something unique that uh, we developed? Or, or more generally, how do you do that? OK, so uh, I can only give you partially ans partial answers, uh, Dior, but it's, we use CAFE underneath. I believe it's a feature of CAFE um, that you can, um, partially, you can have a partially complete and trained model and you can step in and do this last part at the end. So, that's my answer on that. I, I believe it's, uh, it's something in CAFE. I'm not sure about the other libraries uh, and if they support that. No, I know there's a way to do it manually in TensorFlow, I think. But that's cool. Okay. That's really efficient. Yeah, it works well for us, yeah. yeah and uh, we have some numbers, I think, on, in other documentation that shows the little, the additional percent of uh, performance we get from training the neural, neural network for particular situations. Sweet. Thank you. Draw from Fujitsu. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yes, hi. Please, take the stand. It's all yours. So, hi, I'm Christian Hüller from SUSE, um, working on the Cloud Foundry team there. Okay. My question uh, would be, what aspects of Docker are you lacking in the Cloud Foundry system that you're using? Uh. <laughs> and we can speak later. Yeah, also. I mean, okay, that's excellent. Um, okay, well, that, I, I will would like I would love to speak with you later, but I'll give you a quick um, uh, an answer. And 
if I'm wrong and I have um, um, misunderstood some part of CloudFound, well, I apologize. Uh, it's mostly to do with um, preparing uh, the machine on which the Cloud Foundry application is pushed to. So if I needed to install a, you know, the cafe dependencies, for example, um, uh, that was a little bit tricky uh, for us to achieve. Uh, and you know, we read some stuff online, we tried a few things. We had a custom build pack, didn't quite, you know, we had some success with the custom build pack, pulling it in from uh, um, a Git repository. And um, it was somewhat fiddly to, uh, to work out which binary dependencies uh, would be needed and uh, how, how I would uh, then configure the, the, uh, the, the build pack to, to take those um, uh, binary dependencies. Yeah. Does that make sense? That answers the question and I might <coughs> come to you later and then talk to you in detail. That's brilliant, that. that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks yeah. a lot. So that's can brilliant. you just hold your place there for one minute? <coughs> Quick question back to you. How much artificial intelligence do you see uh, being executed from a processing perspective in Cloud Foundry? Have you got much experience around that? Um, <coughs> not that much. Um, from my point of view, it's basically just another workload. So yeah, yeah, um, sure. I personally don't care what you run on Cloud Foundry in that regard. Um, it's just workload and if it needs scalability. Yep. Basically, um, Cloud Foundry just tries to um, make the well, doesn't, you don't have to see the, the, the OpenStack system below anymore. So sure. it's yeah, sure. developer friendly. You just push your code somewhere and it gets executed sure. and you're done with that. So that's, that's a big advantage. So that's why I'm curious. Um, we're just starting on that basically in our yep. team. So picking up on what, what's there. Okay. Um, but I'm trying to gather information on especially use cases and what okay. problems occur there. So yeah, it'll be great if we could chat with you after then and hopefully resolve that yeah. one. So and then. Come to your booth later on. You Very can knock Docker off then, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? No? Okay, great. And by the way, everything Roger's just spoken about was actually developed within Fujitsu. Okay, so Roger and the team have created all this clever stuff from scratch. Yeah, we're obviously relying on some great open yeah, source. Of course. But yeah, using open source components to create the artificial intelligence and machine learning. And as you saw from Roger's demonstration, all very human centric around the driver centricity, around what's safe, what isn't. Um, from manufacturing, I've got a component in my hand, where should that go? For it to be analyzed, what part is it? Where does it need to go? So putting people at the heart of everything we do is important at Fujitsu. Um, okay, uh, how are we looking on time? Cool, right, yeah, a few minutes. Um, so yeah, we're done. Um, so thank you very much from Fujitsu. Uh, we're at A20, please come and have a chat with us, but thank you. Thank you.